ever imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal with your host, Conan Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and cover power. The thing is, though, if you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with sharp and nails. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. <laughs> That's like a science thing, right? That's right, that's right, that's right. It is a science thing. It is a science place. It is a scientific fact. that We're all up in your face. It is time once again for the one, the only, Protonic Reversal. Welcome to it, welcome to it, welcome to it. This episode, Providence. Providence has struck. Someone I've been wanting to have on this show for literal years, and it just has never it's never quite worked out. Uh, I'm, of course, I'm talking about John Darnielle from Mountain Goats. I'm a huge Mountain Goats fan. You wouldn't necessarily know that from just listening to this show, uh, but a very, 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 very big Mountain Goats fan. A whole catalog. Got a lot of time for every, anything John does. And, yeah, I've wanted to have him on for years. And I somewhat randomly ran into him at a Juno 44 show in Chicago, which was pretty awesome, uh, with Lifeguard, who are, who are newer, newer band that uh, also were great. I would love to see them. And we just kind of ended up uh, kind of – we kind of walked out together after after the show and just started talking, as as, as folks do. And I – should I do this show and that uh, he should come on it? And here we are. And we, we did a special episode of this so we could get it in before the tour. And yeah, I, I, there's there's just such a deep catalog with what Mountain Goats do. And I know there's a lot to cover, but I'm just very excited this is happening. So before we get into that, let's uh, let's do this. Welcome to Conan Neutron's Protonic Reversal. I am your host, Conan Neutron. I'm a rock and roll lifer who has toured and recorded for over 23 years, most known for the band Conan Neutron and The Secret Friends. Music is a huge part of my life, and I use the format of this very long-running podcast to talk about music with musicians whose work I enjoy and respect. People who may or may not be household names, but do something very special. This is episode 326. If this is your first time listening to the show, all of the archives are available at ProtonicReversal.com for free. No ads, no sponsors, no kidding. And if you'd like to support the show and get episodes sooner, you can give $1 a month at Patreon.com slash ProtonicReversal and achieve both goals. And if you like this show, or even just a single episode, please consider subscribing on your application or site of choice. Like the episode or even post a review. All that helps people find the show, beat the almighty algorithm, and it's just a darn nice thing to do. Yeah, man, mountain goats. <laughs> I, this is this is great. I mean, he's written books. He's in Poker Face. Uh, you know, there, there's so much to talk about, but uh, the these records are dense, and I'm. Let's just dive right into it and talk to John Darnielle. And with us now is the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. John Jarnell. How you doing, sir? I'm decent. How are you? Good, man. Good, man. You got a, you got a lot of tour dates coming up, man. Yeah, I know. It's going to be a big year. It's going to be a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Got to stay busy. Uh, do you... So for, I, let's start off with I was shocked and pleased uh, to see you in uh, Chloe Savini's metal band in uh, one of my favorite new shows. Yes. It was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh of course i'm talking about poker face uh i i'm not sure like I, it's not like you know they have to inform me about it but i was it's just such a nice thing anytime you see people from like our world like represented on the big screen if you will it's a big screen for me we bought a big tv yeah uh 
How did how did that all come to to pass with the being on Pilgrim's Face? Um, the uh, the sequence was let me see here. I mean, I can, the thing is, I can dig this up in my text messages if I dig far enough. But I, I I texted Ryan <laughs> something that I was thinking about, probably about books. I'm always I read a lot of um, literature and translation, and yeah. Ryan likes noir. Well, there was a whole global noir. There's a lot of noir is a big actual thing, you know, and the French loved it. And there's this writer named Jean Patrick Manchette who I, I remember. Uh, telling him about it. I get very excited. I want to share stuff with Ryan, especially if it's stuff that like, you know, you read this sort of book that like, it, especially when it's a mystery where toward the end, you're like, I can't hold all this in my head. I don't actually get it. I'm, I'm hoping that it's clear to me when it comes through and then it's not. And you feel like the fault is in you, not the writer, you know, that, that, that it's just <laughs> that they're on. Well, Ryan can apprehend all that stuff at first reading. He's really got this amazing polyvalent brain, you know, so I always say, oh, Ryan, you got to read this guy, Manchette, or whoever. Manchette actually is not like that. Manchette is very gonzo. He's just very, very, you know, a lot of people get shot. Sure. A lot of people bleed. Uh, but uh, but I was sharing something with him like that. And he said, oh, hey, good to hear from you. I was thinking of you for this thing I'm doing. Uh, and I said, oh, what? He said, uh, he said, well, it's about music, but like, you know, but I was thinking you could be in it. And we just sort of, it was, it was a, a text chain, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and he said, you know, before we go any further, like, can you act? And I... I usually I would have said the answer is no, because like when I was in high school theater, I was on tech and makeup crew. I, I did some stage stuff, but next to the real actors who, who were with me in those years, like I was not on their level, you know, it's like, I was fine, but, yeah. but, uh, but the, but the good ones, like, you know, there's the people who, when they step on the stage to act, it's, it's like with a, when, a, when, a, when a person is used to playing music on stage, steps on the stage, you can see how physically comfortable they are in that environment. Right. And, and when a person is a good actor, does it like this is an amazing thing right so like any competence i guess but but i just sent him a little video of myself reading some shake uh, reciting some shakespeare and he said oh yeah you're fine <laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing is like when i last tried to act before this would have been 35 years ago or something like that oh wow okay I've, I've, yeah I've, I've lived my life on stage in much of the years since yeah. so that's what i learned up there is like yeah i can act a little i don't think i'm as good as the other people acting next to me but but I could you know but for for a guy first time on camera I I can find my way around and figure it out you know I'm also lucky that the director is incredibly skilled everybody around was super supportive and great. Well yeah and ultimately you're you're playing a musician yeah, yeah. so no, it's, it's not it's, it's not the biggest longest reach that character so yeah yeah you're not in like a, a some period drama or something playing a, like a yeah. <laughs> a lord or lady or something. Uh but I I love the. Well, and and again, something for people that are musicians that's um, can be frustrating sometimes is, and, and you mentioned as an aside, is seeing musicians depicted on screen, uh, and and especially if they just small things like, oh, that's not you wouldn't hold a guitar that way, or, or you know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I I love how your character in Poker Face is, uh, you know, very very adamant about the the mic stand placement is uh you know is very arbitrary about it like, yeah you know, no, that was that was a great piece of a great piece of, of of writing for that uh you know i mean uh but but that's one of the things on set i was like when they handed me a flying v i was like you know people don't really you know it's like, it's like i had a list of guitars that my guy would actually play you know but yeah yeah, 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 yeah right right yeah player guitars yeah, it's like, well, that's the thing is like for TV, as, you know, generally speaking, you'll be going in broad strokes, you know, um, uh, whereas musicians will be very, you know, it's like, uh, well, like, you know, there's a number of plot points in the episode that like ask you to give a little, like the drummer sings, has his own amp that he sings backing vocals through. I personally, yeah. in th 20 some years of the road, have never encountered that. <laughs> so, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's like a show show thing. But, that's like a hey, So I actually game. looked it up because I had a feeling that, that, Ryan wouldn't have done it without some precedent. And actually there was a drummer who died in his home studio of exactly this problem uh, of, of a wow. non grounded amp uh, being used for vocals. And he was singing his own stuff while playing. He died in his home studio. I, I, God, what, what bit was it? Somebody from status quo or somebody like that. I can't quite, quite place it, but, uh, but or Argent, uh, I'm not sure, but, uh, but yeah, so there is precedent for this. And there's actually ample precedent. It happened. It used to happen to a bunch of people. And now, now you don't, under any circumstances, play with an ungrounded amp. But, uh, but yeah, so the, the plot twist is kind of genius there.
Yeah, no, I, I thought that was very well written. I mean, no, no shocker. I mean, Ryan's a shocker. He's user. pretty good at writing. Yeah, <laughs> he's all right. He's getting good. Yeah, uh, the but I I found that to be you know very enjoyable. Again, it's, it's great to see uh, uh, you know weirdo rock representation on screen. I also like that you basically snuck in like a like a little bit of a mountain goat style song like on the tour bus. That was that was a delight. Yeah, I mean, I was ad libbing that on set. <laughs> That's why I <it's> like, <laughs> like, like, I, I, I I'm I'm just sort of. Like, I could have, they had another song in the uh, script and I was like, well, you know, that's my skill set, you know, is, is songs. And so uh, yeah. I thought, you know, I can do something that there will be a little more like what a musician would do. Uh, you know, I did that with the other, I also, the, um, the, what was it called? The, the alimony one earlier on. That's me too. You know, uh, <laughs> right. was, uh, exactly. there yeah. was a different version of that song in the original draft. And I said, well, you know, this is not actually what this guy would do, right? This guy would actually be working on an actual song instead of just spitting out rhymes. So, so yeah, so I, I, I did some, did some, uh, some, some sanding, you know? Well, and I also, you know, I just, I just like the fact that, that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's that you get a little more of that lived in experience of like things that might actually happen on this tour bus, you know, maybe not with these specific people, but it's, it's, it establishes enough criteria that it takes you into the moment, uh, very very adeptly well it's a tour rv actually <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, well yeah yeah yeah. it's not even the bus it's an rv yeah which is which is uh you know i know juice does that a few other bands but yeah. no, do we really that's <laughs> awesome wow i didn't know that yeah yeah they they absolutely they, and they basically that's why they live on the road hate eternal has a tricked out van that i've had the good fortune to see uh where the uh there's a cargo hold in the back uh behind a wall but then the inside of the van is um is like four sleeping chambers right behind the oh wow behind okay. the driver and the shotgun then the whole back is like it's sort of like like a like a cold storage or something like that you know where they're like, and they're stacked so you would just pile in at the end of the night and lie down just like you would on a bus it's it's really hip there's a band there's a band i played with years ago uh from north carolina if i remember right called colossus that toured out of an ambulance. oh i remember colossus yeah yeah and 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 we <laughs> one of those things where you're yeah, you know, you're, you're playing with a band, you don't know them, and you're like, oh, these guys, you know, these fellows are nice. That's awesome. And then we were making bets, you know, not with actual money, on like what they sounded like. I'm like, oh, well, I think it'll sound like Chavez, or I think it'll sound like this. It's like, oh, they sound like Iron Maiden. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I didn't, yeah. have, didn't have that on my bingo card. That's no, awesome. That's, that's funny because that was Colossus came around early in a in a sort of a revival of chops, you know, of of people. Yeah. You know, I come from the generation of of bands that were like very inspired by the Velvet Underground. Right. Do the do the thing that comes with your enthusiasm first, and 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 worry less about your technical proficiency. Which is funny because that is the Velvets, except that Lou Reed had been doing it for ten years at that point. So they're all and Kale is classically trained. So so there's a little there's a little hocus pocus in the uh, you know in the oh we don't really play that well. It's like yeah you do actually you just play in a different style. But uh, yeah. but there's a whole generation of indie bands who are leaning into that sort of it's not about the playing it's about the energy thing. And then on the other side of that, in the early 2000s, I feel like bands like got the drive in and um, uh, who's that band that becomes super proggy? Um, uh, uh, in Cambria. Is it, when, 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 oh, Cody. Yeah, they're not, yeah, of course. Yeah. They're not <laughs> indie, right? But they do come out of that legacy. And then it's something like, well, what if we're doing big chopsy prog? You know, and it's really, to me, that's amazing yeah. stuff. And um, and yeah, wait, what was my break? My springing off point? Colossus, right? I think that's right at a point where people are like, you know, what if I actually played the hell out of this guitar? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and I love that, like, the incongruity of, you know, at the time, it was sort of like if you, someone was going to sound like Iron Maiden, they would have a certain look. And they, these guys just look like indie rock dudes. And it was, you, yeah. know, you wouldn't know. And I, I always appreciate that where you don't, you don't quite know what you're going to get into uh, when, until they start going. And it's like, oh, didn't, didn't, didn't think that was going to be what's happening, but this is great. Uh, that CD was at large in the van for years, too. No, it's cool. <laughs> We did the CD exchange, but anyway, having nothing to do with Colossus, I, I was thinking of earlier today about at the time when I first got into your stuff into mountain goats, it was kind of on the later side. Like I moved to the Bay area in, in 95, I, but I didn't know anything about you until I don't know, 2002, uh, uh, somewhere along the way. Was, I think that's when Tallahassee came out. Right. Um, and at the time I was like, Oh wow, I'm really late to the party. But then I was thinking about it. I was like, oh, that was over 20 years ago. Yeah, so, no, Tallahassee <laughs> is no longer late to the party. <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, you know, you hang out for a long time. Uh, but the the origin, uh, you were in the Bay Area for quite a for quite a while, uh, right? I mean, I was where? 90s. 
you were in the Bay Area for no, for I have a never while. lived in the Bay Area. Uh, I, I, oh, the only, the only you only, played there a lot. I mean, yeah, the played there a bunch. That was the first first place away from Southern California that we played. Um, but I lived in Southern California. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that, and that's for for, for for people that are not familiar with uh, California distances. That's yeah, it's a decent drive. It, it, it's like a well, yeah, four Southern and Northern are different. You know, people from both sides have often advocated for the idea of having there be two Californias, which is usually a joke. But uh, but. But yeah, but they are they are different places over the grapevine, and the thing is, it's not just there's so many Californias. California is sort of like I don't know, it's a uh, I don't know where else is like this, but you know, there's Central California is one thing, Eastern California. It, it's like in Oregon you have the cities, and Eastern Oregon these are very different places, very different. Um, more in common with uh, Idaho than yeah yeah <laughs> than, uh, yeah. Well, Oregon. there's people right now. There's a really dumb movement going on to try and. Uh, uh, make Eastern Oregon part of Idaho. Right? So, yeah, yeah, I, I know it's it's it's, it's so it's terrible. The thing is, it's it's both terrible so and sick. you know, I knew a lot of people in Portland who had grown up uh, young and closeted in Eastern Oregon, and they could not wait yeah. to go to Portland. It was like, let me yeah, get yeah. somewhere where I'm not having to like look behind me at all times, you know. And uh, uh, so, but I, but at the same time, I think making a new state so you can be hateful is probably not the great look. You know? <laughs> That's a great motivator, I guess. Well, I'm from the Central Valley originally. That's where I grew up, and I couldn't get out fast. Oh, what town? Uh, from Modesto. Oh, uh, Modesto. Wow, there's a song by um, True Love Always called Modesto. Uh, that I've, I've, been to, I've been to literally all of these towns right uh, in my youth, so all yeah, over. Yeah, for sure. Davis. Uh, God, I mean, Davis is, is, is way further up, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I've been all over that, that area, yeah. Yeah, and it, it was always a huge deal if a band ever came to Modesto. It's like, oh my God, there's a band. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> but I, yeah, I couldn't get out fast enough because it was a cultural thing. But I mean, they even made that the that one proposal a few years back that was like, and it was some libertarian guy that was like, oh, we're gonna make nine states, and one of them's gonna be like Fredonia or you know, you know, some kind of silly thing of, of where it's like, all right, you you were so close to having a good idea, but yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Uh, but one of them was going to be like some tech dude utopia kind of is that, that that was his motivating factor and that's one of the reasons why it failed but anyway yeah uh oh yeah yeah so 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 go so going back um i think you're, you're is it 22 records now under the mountain code I, the, 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 I, it's i have a joke about it it's at least one <laughs> Other than that, I, I don't really know I, I when people tell me how many it is i believe them but uh but i don't know well, and pre pre coroner's gambit is hard for me because I have them on like these like you know degenerated cassettes that are <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I don't even have anything to play on. Well, have anymore, you been around but... that long? Have you got the have you have you got physical copies of the tapes? I do, I do. Yeah, awesome! I wow. Yeah, not everybody does. Uh, I don't have a tape player anymore, but I have the t- I have the I have the tapes. Uh, I actually donated the tape player, which was great, to a radio station that I that I used to. Uh, do this actual show on i don't know if anyone even used it but i kind of feel bad about that because i was like oh i've got these things that are not digitized that i would love to listen to uh but uh da, 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 da. yeah yeah i mean it's so what i'm getting at is it's, 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 a, it's a wide and varied uh discography that the mountain goats as a band kind of has uh, several evolutionary uh periods it seems right. like, like like jurassic period cretaceous period so on yes. and so on yes Yes. And uh, I, I love to see it because it's I, you can go back and like kind of see the 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 um, you know the early man model uh, with this, but the songwriting's always been there. And I for me the early aesthetic of like uh, it was like the, the condenser mic on the on the the boombox kind of kind of thing, and like that being almost part of the sound uh, and the appeal for some folks of the music to like you know more hi fi affairs. Uh, has the writing process for you changed during the course of this? Um, oh yeah, yeah, no doubt. Uh, and the thing is, like, like if people like the early songs, I'm glad they do. But I think that one of the journeys, and there's a bunch of arcs you can trace with any band that hangs around as long as we have. It's not unique to me, but uh, but like the early stuff is very about energy, right? Like about yeah, and I don't not just not just like in terms of intensity, right? But but like the the, the particular energy of you're hearing a song at the exact minute that it, that it finishes getting written. Right. It's like, it's not even, you know, it's, I, I've only been working on it for an hour at most by the time you hear it tracked and often for only 15 minutes or so. That's true of almost all the early stuff. Right. Um, I don't start 
pre-writing songs to record until Rachel and me go into the studio, right? Well, now we want to record some songs. We practice them a little bit because there's two people playing, right? So otherwise, with my stuff, when it was just me and the guitar, it doesn't matter if I slow up and speed down. Who cares? Right? It's, like, it's like nobody's, right, right. nobody's no playing follow, drums. Yeah. It's, like, it's fine. It speeds up. It's part of the charm, you know? Um, but you don't really do that with other musicians unless you've agreed on it previously at this point i'm going to up the tempo and then you come with me you know although in the early days and probably still to some extent although i think my tempo is better now um you know peter would like tell we would borrow a drummer often from the opening band and peter say right. so you follow me and i'm following john when he starts to speed up just come along with me <laughs> and so, and so, and peter got really good at that right um right right i now have one of the best drummers in music and I've had him He's since 2009, I think. Uh, yeah, and and uh, or eight. So I mean, my tempo is now actually quite good. I think. Um, but that's a, and my tempo was good when I was a pianist. But playing guitar since I'm self-taught, I never really had pause to do to learn to count and stuff. But uh, but but so yeah. So so first it's me, then it's me and Rachel, and then and well, it's me, Rachel, Amy, Roseanne, and Sarah. Um, yeah. And. Uh, and then I moved to Chicago in 95. So th that's a very brief window, but it's a window during which I'm writing a lot. And it's a very, uh, it's a time of, of, of really rapid growth in indie rock of, you know, a whole lot of possible worlds are opening up. CMJ is getting so big, you know, um, yeah. uh, South by is, is, was still a very small festival at the beginning of that period and, and was getting bigger by the mid nineties and, and all that stuff is going on. And then I'm alone for a couple more years until, um, uh, well, not exactly alone because I took Peter on these tours that Rachel was going to do but couldn't, and uh, and so I had a bassist. But then, you know, I was alone in the Midwest, and Peter was wherever he was. So I I, I made a couple more records mainly by myself, you know, with some help. And uh, and then when 4AD came calling, I was like, well, if there's enough budget, I'll get Peter on a record, and we'll, you know, so we can pick up the thread of what we had been doing on tour in '95 that sounded really good, and hardly anybody ever got to hear it, right? So. Um, so yeah, so that was that was Tallahassee. We recorded that in October of two thousand one, and 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 that's sort of and that phase lasts until we add a drummer, uh, which is uh, we were borrowing, like I say, borrowing drummers from our opening acts, sort of to to conclude our sets just for fun. We'd say, hey, sit in for the last couple songs, and and uh, and they would learn them, and then in two thousand seven is when well, yeah 2007 is heretic pride right that was yeah the, we the recorded that in 07 and it comes out in 08 i think uh and so that's when john worster had played one show with us like a christmas show christmas show he'd done alone with me and then he did one show i think just just being a drummer i forget what the exact order of business was but he played with us it was really good so we brought him out to the album and then he then he was in the band and 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 that became the band. And then Matt Douglas joined after doing woodwind arrangements uh, in 2009, I think. So 10 years later, we added a fourth guy. Uh, and uh, who, you know, for me, the the musical inspiration that, that each one of those guys brings as they come in makes for a slow growth. And I don't do seminars or advice or anything, but always remaining open to growth and not being in a giant hurry about it. <laughs> have worked well for me. You know? <laughs> right, so, right. Well, and that was, uh, I think that the first record, because that was after Life of the World to Come, so that would have been All Eternal's deck, I think, right? Uh, which, Life of the World uh, to Come, is Worcester on the, no, Worcester is on Life of the World to Come. Uh, he, he, he's, uh, he, he is, but the, um, this that, that one doesn't have the strings, I don't think. Oh, no, no, it? so it does have strings, but those strings are by Owen Pallet. Um, okay, okay, good, good. Matt's first record is Beat the Champ. That's right. That's right. Because that's there's, uh, horns, I, I, there's I, horns on Transcendental Youth, but those are by Matthew White, um, and uh, he came down from Virginia. And then Matt was close by, and Brandon Eggleston, the producer, knew him and said, "You got to meet Matty Bones. He, he does stuff for Aaron, um, uh, uh, Aaron uh, McEwen, and he's great." And he was great. <laughs> it was like you, you spend yeah, a week yeah. in the studio with him. You go, "I wanted this to get this guy on the bus," so we did. Yeah, no, and there has been a very, uh, you know, slow growth, slow but steady growth uh, with it that has uh, kind of made it into like a big, a bigger band, uh, so to speak. Yes. Uh, knowing full well that things can collapse and uh, expand as necessary. Yeah, if I if I play by myself, it's still the mountain goats. Well, exactly. Yeah, and 
and I think that so going back to earlier, like the, like with the '90s stuff, then the fact that like you were recording it shortly after writing it, I think that there's something also about the way that those are recorded that lends that immediacy. Where it just feels like you're in the room. It well, feels like you are. I mean, you're as close as you can get to that, right? Like right. when Rick Rubin does those American recordings, that's the feeling he wants to impart, right? He wants you to feel like, oh wow, it's just me and a guy in a room. But it's you know. It's at many more layers of removal than a guy who just wrote a song and pressed record and you can hear the gears of the machine. You know, there's 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 a yeah. the the stuff that 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 people would want to clean off to me was was part of, you know, like you couldn't get what I was doing from anybody else really. Other people would call their stuff lo fi, but it was on a four track and they were doing takes and fixing things right and i was like right, right, right. and exactly. my stuff yeah. was like as raw as it could really get um and i liked that a lot you know uh and i still like a lot of that stuff uh, you know but I, I i do think you know to to commit to that is like that's your deal that's a sort of you know the kind of guy who says you know i've always believed this and nobody's gonna change my mind well then that guy's an infant you know <laughs> this, you know <laughs> except that even infants sure, no yeah. infants will grow it's like if you have anything that's like the thing, it's like, you know, absolutely not. No one can change my mind on this. Well, then <laughs> then you have yeah, a problem. Yeah. That's, that's like pathology is like you you have to grow and change some, uh, you know, and we, without naming any, there have been bands that barely change at all. And that is their charm, you know, but but you tend people tend to lose interest in those bands. You know, they, they don't. Well, it's, it's workmanlike, but it's not necessarily a creative yeah. Uh, no, usually you get, you get your fill of a band who is a is a completely predictable quantity, you know. So yeah. so you know, how you grow and how you change, how quickly you do it. Well, I'm I'm an advocate of, of sticking around way too long with one with one process <laughs> just, just in case you missed something, you know. It's like uh, sure, uh yeah. I'm I'm into it. I don't think you have to be in a hurry. Whereas the thing is in this business, uh you know, in 95, I had people breathing down my neck to go into a studio and re-record some of these songs with a full band so we could reach as many people as possible. And I'd be like, no, I don't care about that opinion. You know, the songs are done. I don't want to re-record any old songs. Oh, but most people when they hear this, you know, they, they, they can't really get through it. That's their problem. <laughs> it's like, I'm not, I'm not yeah. trying to sell this to people. It's like the people who are already interested in it, those are the people I'm trying to reach. And if new people come in, then those are the people I'm trying to reach. I'm not trying to go out and bang down on people's doors and make the list of the mountain goats. That's not my style. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. And it, it probably would be ill-advised even if it was. <laughs> well, but is, but that is the model generally. It's like you're trying to get your stuff yeah. in front of as many people as possible. And I've always thought, well, what if, what if we mainly try and get it in front of people who have already – indicated in some way that they're interested <laughs> you know it's like well, and there's a deep there's a deep connection to the catalog for the people that it, it that it um that it does connect with yeah. right like and something yeah. like yeah and if you if you do these like there's this music is full of stories of a band who you know just decides well now i'm doing this and it's a complete turnabout now look if that's actually where your heart is at aesthetically if that's what you're feeling now you should go ahead and turn from your rock album to your jazz album and say, hey, you know, no, that's where I'm at. And if you're not willing to come on that walk with me, fine. But if you're doing that turn in a hurry, you know, because that's the way the wind is blowing, I think it's a bad idea because the wind's going to blow another way <laughs> later anyway. So, so following the wind is a bad idea. Uh, but but it's, yep. it's a tricky thing because, you know, because resistance to change for its own sake uh, is, you know, is stagnation. It's not good. You know? and, and there's certainly... Uh, cautionary tales, you know. There's your, your tales from the Elder or Operation Mind Crime or something, where it's like, okay, ooh, Cold not, Lake but... in metal is sort of the most legendary. Cold Lake, one. yes. <laughs> um, there's, there's that one. There's also uh, Discharge. You uh, uh, did a, oh, a legendary wow. metal turn at the time when all the punk bands were in metal turn. And there's you can dig up the live sets from this, where like the live set in in Northern California, just the audience is like, we have waited a long time to see you. And now you're bringing this. <laughs> so, I have a friend from back in the day who is still mad about it. Oh, it's, it's an amazing, it's, a, I mean, the tape exists and it's like, uh, uh, what's funny about, I think both cold Lake and that, and a lot of these turns is you can often hear what these bands were listening to that made them go, God, I want to do that. You know? And uh, like, I'll go to my grave saying that when Celtic Frost made Cold Lake, somebody had played them Christian Death's Ashes and Catastrophe Ballet, and especially yeah. Ashes. And, and they were like, oh, man, that's a cool sounding record, man. What if we did that? But in our style, you know, and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 
and it, it was not a good fit. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Nobody was looking for it. People were like, no, we like the thing that you already do. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, you also don't know. I think a good producer knows. It's like, I don't know. If this is what you're trying to do, my job is to help you do it, you know? Yeah. Well, exactly. And that that is, in fact, being a good producer, for yeah. sure. Well, the thing is, like, uh, you have to take in those big chances. Those records are great precisely because they take a lot more guts than saying, well, here's the record I know my people are going to love, Right. Ideally, I think as a longtime guy in this, yeah. you want to strike a balance between asking your audience who already exists, hey, what if we did it like this? Do you notice that this is still me? This is still, I'm still doing the things that you like, but I'm not going to do them the exact same way as last time because that is boring, you know? Uh, and you see how far you can stretch that, right? Um, I have nothing but respect, for, though, for guys who are like, nope, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> like, this is what yeah. we want to do. And it's not because it's going to be big and famous. It's because this is where we're at. Although Tom G. Warrior hates that record. He's like, he, 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 he just <laughs> thinks, you know, that they, they, they got persuaded to do some stuff that wasn't really them. I, I don't know what it's like to be in that sort of situation. Yeah, why? Well, that's 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 a totally different, uh, totally different world, almost from uh, you know, like that 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 world. So and, well, especially given like that's the '80s in metal, and suddenly yeah. people smell money, right? And like, and that's the thing. That's that's what happens. You know, it happened a lot with with uh, with the metal bands a few years later when when grunge is getting big, and a lot of them are like, oh, you know, we gotta you know, change up our, our look and our feel a little bit because the money's going over here. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah, that's so over here. Exactly. In the case of Celtic Frost, he was like, you know, fellas, if we just change this and that, we could be playing much bigger rooms. And and people don't know outside of the business is like, you know, playing much bigger rooms. Yeah, it means more money. But in the case of at a certain level, it means, God, what if we could play a club where the bathroom is in the dressing room? instead of across <laughs> the club because i remember when right. we graduated yeah, yeah. from that right yeah. i used to have to always leave the dressing room to go to the bathroom across the club now i'm not too good for that but we were at all right but we were too big for that insofar as i couldn't go to the bathroom without people talking to me right which is not so yeah. bad except that i'm trying to save it for the stage and and it would take me 25 minutes you know to get from dressing room to bathroom and back and i'm trying not to do that i'm trying to conserve you you want to be alone right and uh, and it's, you're running the gauntlet of love. Almost. It's just, no, it's, and it's like, you, know, you feel bad bitching about it. But at the same time, it's like you really need your your workspace to be your workspace so you can be as good as you can possibly be on stage. Right. And so yeah. when you graduate up to, to to clubs where it's like, no, we don't play one that doesn't have a bathroom, the dressing room anymore. You know, you go, oh, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> and I just well, and that's, that's huge. Yeah, that's huge. And, and I suspect Frost you, was too. like, man, what if. You know, what 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 if we didn't have to drive 16 hours between shows anymore, you know, when we go to the U.S., right? Right. Because right. that's that, that's a thing is like when you graduate to bigger rooms, you also get to shorten your drives sometimes or even hire a driver. All these things, you know, uh, are considerations, I think, of bands that wind up making that kind of turn. Uh, certainly, certainly. And, and there's there's a bunch of stuff to get into there. But while we were talking about stylistic shifts and, you know, doing following your creative uh, impulses and whatnot, I just want to say I want to give a shout out to Goths. I think that's a fantastic. Oh, thank you. I'm very, books. very fond of it. Yeah. And, and that was one that, you know, like whatever, 16th record or something. And I, like I was like, what? Like I was like super surprised, like not bummed out, but just surprised uh, that I was like, oh, wow, like this is. This is simultaneously celebrating a genre of music, in, in most cases, uh, lyrically informed from that genre of music and culture, uh, but doing so in a way that isn't predatory, I guess is uh, maybe that might be a strong term, but do you know what I mean when I say it? Like, I feel like you, you handle it with like a massive amount of respect, but it's still you guys. It's still you. It's still well, you. I mean, I listened you. to all that music when I was younger, so I'm writing about stuff that is part of me, right? Um, yeah, but I also, I mean, there's a lot that that's a pretty, I love to think about that record because it, it, it has a, um, it had a formal restriction for the writing, which was, I'm only writing on this, not just on a uh, keyboard, but on a specific keyboard in my house that had these beat presets, right. Um, that I don't know if any of the demos have ever come out, but, um, but yeah, I think it's in the, the deluxe edition. I think that isn't there a couple demos. No, the deluxe edition has the ambient mixes of four tracks. Oh, that's um, right. 
<laughs> but I, I have it. I have it, but I haven't listened to it in a while. Sorry. So, there's a song that came out that was written for the album. Not, not we didn't want to use the studio version, but I think you can get it called "Get High and Listen to the Cure." That that has one of these presets from the Office Kawaii, which is just a digital 88 key piano, uh, and it has these beat presets, right? Um, whose function is mainly if you don't want to play to a metronome, you can use these, and then it functions like a metronome, right? But um, but they also function like beats, right? And I went, oh, I'll use a different one for every song. And there's like 17 of them. I don't need 17 songs for an album, so I, you know, have five extra when I get done. Um, but I remember like Andrew Eldritch's number two, I think, um, and, and I yeah. would just note what it was on the on the lyric sheet when I was writing it out. And so this was a formal restriction. That was the only place I was writing, and uh, and I would use the Fender Rhodes tone on it. Uh, and then like the original title of the record was like. Um, uh, what was it? Death Rock Suite for Fender Roads and Voice or something like that. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, but, but yeah, so formal restrictions like that are, are really, to me, are, are really fun. I, I think it's a Catholic impulse, you know, that, that, that you think if you cutting off possibilities is where you find the most possibilities. Right. Well, and you you don't get uh you know what do you call it analysis paralysis, right? You don't, you don't like you can just be like okay no this is what I'm doing this is this is yes what's happening. yes yeah no I don't I hadn't heard that term it's usually not something I suffer from I I'm really good at not overthinking what I'm gonna do uh, right which the thing is I think people get confused between that and outlining or planning is like you can still outline and plan and and muse on it without. I mean, I think the problem with, with overanalyzing your stuff is when you start thinking about yourself too much, right? You start thinking about what you think of it, right? Sure, that's sure. Part, yeah, yeah. That's the part you just want to defer. You want to say, I don't I don't have an opinion about this <laughs> at all. I'm just doing a thing, you know? You want to treat it as much like breaking up rocks with a pickaxe as you can, you know, that, that you're not going, oh, well, this will be good when I, no, no, this, I'm doing a thing. Right. That's, that, that to me is like is a, is a great secret of, of doing work is that like I know people who will like constantly think, well, when I do this, people will think this. <sighs> do not even for a second. <laughs> like not why? Who cares? <laughs> it's like the art doesn't care. You know, like the art only cares about what you're doing with it. You know, so. So, yeah. So these little formal restrictions are sort of ways to to get deeper inside it as almost a math equation. Right. And it's workmanlike. Too. Like I think of the story of Nick Cave putting on a suit and tie and going yeah. to the piano to go write. Yeah, yeah. we have similar. I don't get dressed uh, for it. I used to have places. Now I work everywhere. But uh, but it's the same thing. It's like regarding creative work as work. For those of us for whom this is a productive way of thinking, we believe it very strongly. You know, it's like I don't. I'm not sitting around waiting for the muse to hit me. I, I work, I go to work. I don't have to do it every day. I have other things I also have to do. Right. But when I, when I, when I do, it's like, I'm not, I'm not there believing that, that I'm going to, you know, that I'm waiting for a dream to come along. I'm, I'm, I'm doing something. I'm doing a thing. The same as if I were washing dishes. And in the culture, it's so pervasive of that, you know, that lightning strike of, oh, I don't know where it came from as inspiration. And, 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 and it's like, well, yeah, that does happen. Sure. But there's also, it's is it enjoyable? Yes, well, this, it is also. This is one of those things I get in trouble for talking about because uh, I have a shtick where I say there's no such thing as writer's block, right? And then people right. who people get mad and go, "Well, look, I'm too depressed to write." Well, that's different, you know. That's yeah. not it. That's but, not writer's block. But that's... the notion of this thing, yeah. writer's block, is a way of thinking about writing. Right? I don't think about writing that way, and that's why I don't get writer's block. <laughs> it's like, I to me, it, and one of my shticks about it is is like I bet. If I sent some goons to your house with weapons, right, and they told you <laughs> to write so them a sonnet, I bet you won't have writer's block anymore. <laughs> I bet you will He's write raise the And maybe yeah. the sonnet sucks, but the point is not whether it's good or bad. The only point is that you can write. If if yeah. you if you understand that at the outset, then you're doing that process of trying to take yourself out of it. And I think that's what you know, that's the mystery of all creative work is that like, I think you do your best creative work when you disinvest your ego and yourself from it. And mind you, that's a game because once you finish the thing, then your ego gets repaid in full, right? It's like you get, right. you know, if you yeah. defer your own investment in it for the duration of the process of making it, 
oh boy, when you're done, then you get to bathe in your ego, right? And so, so it's not like <laughs> actually being selfless. You're sort of just deferring it. And so, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's one of my, one of my deals. Well, tell me about writing something like Shelf, because we, we were talking about goths. I think that's a great allegory uh, and a great example of allegory and song and how it doesn't have to be um, uh, didactic in, in a way that would be tiresome or something along those lines. Like it, it moves nicely. Um, it's got an emotional uh, pathos to it. But yeah, it, it's it, it is also em- embodies a genre that you're clearly celebrating. So tell yeah. me about Shelved. Well, I only wrote two thirds of Shelved. Um, Peter it's wrote Peter, the, last, Peter. the last verse yeah. of Coda. Um, so the thing is, this is one fun thing when you're writing a thematic album and it's also fun because it's one of the, one of the hardest parts is like, once you realize it's going to have a very tight theme, everything has to have something to do with goth, right? Um, everything. And, and, you know, so you think, well, I wrote out a list of bands and ideas and moments in the history of it. Okay. was the bat cave? Got to write something about the bat cave. Got to write something about the West Coast, which is its own goth as compared to like Minnesota and Florida, which had their own, the North had their own thing, South had their own thing. New York sort of had more of it, but less of a scene, you know, whereas in Southern California, the goth scene was for real, but it wasn't even called goth for the, or it was called death rock. And so death there's, rock. there's yeah. all these things to think about, right? And, but are there, are there 14 or 15 things to think about? I didn't know. So I start making notes on possible scenarios. And, I, and one of them is, you know, well, very few people stay goth forever, right? Most, for most people, yeah. it's a phase, right? It's a, it's a, it's a thing that, that you, you know, even if you stay sort of goth in spirit, you're not in the scene anymore after a while, you know? And, uh, and, and I thought about bands that were, you know, I thought about a band that, that might have enough juice to maybe push through to the next level, you know, uh, if they were a little less goth and what they're, you know, and then as they get older in the song, I'm like, I say, well, what if, what if this band is like, you know, they're not big enough to headline their own shows, but they're getting asked to open shows and they, they, they're conflicted between, you know, wanting wanting to grow but also not wanting to sort of be the, the band that has to open and stuff and so yeah, and they're an aging yeah. goth band and uh uh and that's the thing it's like it's i think every musician because i've been doing this for a living now for since 2000 full-time living since 2005 or no 2004 um possibly 2003 now that i think about it but but uh, yeah, <laughs> 20 years um Auction. so so uh so yeah you often wonder, you know, am I going to have to at some point shelve this work and go back to, to the normal day job? You do that a lot, especially in the first 10 years on it. At this point, I'm technically unemployable, right? Like an employer, uh, if you <laughs> explain hire... this gap in your employment record. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. it's not only that, it's like, you don't have the skills in the workplace that somebody who's never been in it has. <laughs> it's sure. like, yeah, like well, right. Yeah. 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 A 16 year old entering it is better equipped than you whose only memory of the workplace is from before you went off and did your thing. So, um, so yeah, but, but you do go through these periods of thinking, you know, especially if you're on the road touring and, 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 you know, in years that are, you know, harder, it's like, man, maybe I should, I should hang up my shoes, you know, and, uh, and, but you don't want to. And so that, I mean, that's the, the song is about imagining myself in the shoes of somebody whose chances at big success are bigger than the stuff I've personally experienced, like people who are playing arenas, you know, or might be playing arenas, that sort of thing. Well, and that, you know, that uh, whether someone can or will uh, sublimate their, what they perceive as their own identity to maintain relevancy uh, yeah. as well, you know, which is not to get all high minded about it, but I think that's what I get out of it anyway. I, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, look, that's a great record. And, and that's, it's, it's, it's something that, I think you can feel the love in that one too, like of, of that genre and that world and that kind of that aspect of freaks, nerds and weirdos. Uh, and that's kind of rarely celebrated, even though I was goth adjacent, not goth myself. Like that's I what that I consider was, myself. You know, I was, I was never, uh, didn't tease up my hair. I dyed it black, you know, but, uh, yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah. but yeah. I did some black nail polish, but you know, not long. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, and that's, I, I just think that's beautiful. I think that's a really wonderful thing. And, and then it takes me back to uh, the concept record as a, as a whole, right? Because I know Tallahassee is, uh, was West Texas the, the first concept record? Um, 
Well, no, no. Uh, Sweden uh, is is it? Oh, Sweden, is, sure. Is yeah, resolving yeah. relationship record. Um, I mean, yeah, the yeah, characters yeah. aren't really strongly defined. You know, they don't, and the movement isn't, and not every song really fits into a narrative arc. But uh, but is it is for sure a collapsing relationship record? Yeah, of, of you know, of which uh, Tallahassee already also was. Um... I mean, look, any record with no children on it is a... Yeah, you, you, yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> which, is a, which is a set highlight. Uh, yes, and we didn't play it forever. We didn't play it a lot yeah. after it was first released. I, did, I didn't really think it it would be good live. Uh, <laughs> just as what I know. <laughs> and now it's this, this huge cathartic moment for the audience like it's everyone's whole like, thing yeah well who, who doesn't love six, the run who doesn't something. love six eight time everybody loves six eight right? yeah so. yeah yeah. It's, yeah exactly drive like jehu and uh, no children <laughs> uh yeah it's i mean was that and i guess since you've written so many so many songs so many great songs and and you know some of them you're like oh this is awesome i love this and then you know oh it doesn't work live or it doesn't connect in the way that you think it's going to oh okay cool well, i still know it's a good song and then there are there, there ones that surprise you were like oh that's the one that one okay yeah yeah um you mean as far as like stuff working live yeah yeah live and you know in, in general i suppose but certainly um when you have as deep of a catalog like it has to be thousands of songs at this point that you, that you, that you well read. it's at least one be, right? Yeah, right, at least one thousand. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean at least one song. Uh, so no, I I don't know how many. Uh, I, I, I mean hundreds. I don't know. Yeah. I was thinking about the. Uh, uh, <laughs> did you ever see that website, The Bastard Children of Screaming Jay? Uh, uh, well, Jay's kids. It was Jay's kids. Yeah. Was um, it Jay's? Oh, I thought that maybe I. I think I can't. Yeah, it's tough line now. But I mean, you know, I named the mountain goes after as as a line from a Screaming Jay Hawkins song. So, uh, say so yeah, I'm, I'm a Screaming Jay fan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, as I, as well. Uh, but yeah, in this case, you know, songs being, you know, being, being your children. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you... <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of, it's funny. It is a hard thing to really talk about in a coherent way, but like you do have the ones you think are going to pop super hard live and that turn out to be yeah. fine, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and you do have like, I'll say Pace Dorado. I, I didn't think that was going to be worth anything live uh, off of getting into knives. I was like, nah, because it's a very even song. It's very like the church or whoever, where it's like it doesn't have a lot of big uh, energy surge moments. And in my experience, audiences want a surge of energy, right? That's that's one thing they respond to. And I think it's not just in my style of music, but in dance music, you know, the drop is a thing. All, all these, you know, uh, so many styles of music are are not, not about keeping an even keel, you know, it's like they're about, right, right. about going somewhere and, and that going somewhere is often understood as going from a place of this degree of energy to a greater degree of energy. Pace Dorado is not that, right? It has an opening out section, but it, it ends at the same volume it starts in, you know, and, uh, uh, but man, live, that thing has been really pops. dependably popping, right? And so that was a big surprise to me. Um, uh, I can't think of which ones have gone the other way, um, but they're, they they are there because I, I I know we have nights where I'll be putting the set list together. And say, what about this? I'll go, you know, they're just not feeling that one. <laughs> it, well, it could still be right. good, and I'll be, I, you know, I mean, it already is good, <laughs> and then they're not feeling yeah, it. So, yeah. And I, to me, is like the live set is not about me forcing my will on what I want to play. <laughs> it's a, it's, a, like, it's again, it's in the middle. I don't want to just play everybody's favorite songs. You know, I, I think that's a boring set. You know. But I do want to play songs that audiences reliably go, oh, I love that. That's really fun, you know, so. Because you're treating like a communal experience. And there's yeah, a given time. Yeah, so. and, and I'm only, we are, we don't constitute a very large proportion of that community, right? We're, we're only five of them, so. Well, and there's, and there's songs like Best Ever Death Metal Band in Denton, which just seems to, uh, you know, have this, this life that goes beyond the Mountain Goats even, uh, maybe some, but because of the lyrical content and the emotion behind it, um, but people have a real connection to that song. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, and that can be that, and then go both ways. I mean, like, obviously, people can get way too intense. I mean, uh, that's a uh, that's fine. But like, that's it's it's kind of astounding that uh, I was thinking about when I when I first started listening to Mountain Goats, I was like, wow, I don't think I've ever heard a song like this. <laughs> and again, it was it was a celebration of 
a style of a style of music that wasn't being actively played in the song, right. but like done as allegory. And I was like, wow, that's so clever. Like I like, and of course, you know, the, the story itself is just anyone that's ever been come from a small town or something. Jesus. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's relatable, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, so I think that's why it has a certain amount of uh, timelessness to it that like people are going to connect to that, whether they were, maybe they weren't born when it came out, who knows? But uh, I mean, I think that's quite remarkable. No, thank you. Uh, you know, I was just thinking about the other thing you were talking about. Uh, the like, there's a song, the title track from Dark in here. I always mm-hmm. thought that would be really great live. It took us a long time to find the zone for it. You know, it's like um, that's a good point, and right because but see, but you don't speaks, always find it. That speaks yeah. to the idea of like, well, if you believe that it's going to get there, keep playing it live, right? As long as people aren't like, like you know, completely deflated by it, the set doesn't have to be every song lands like a punch to the jaw, right? And this is something you learn by being a deadhead, right? It's like the Grateful Dead. Um, they play all these songs and they don't always land. And then some tours, the song they've been playing for a few years in a row will suddenly just grow wings, right? And uh, right. and and go someplace new. On a given night, that can happen. Once or twice in a tour, they play it every night and it, some nights it's great. And then suddenly there this song just takes off, right? Um, there's versions of Black Peter like that. They're just, uh, just you know, wow. Suddenly they know, okay, there's versions of... Uh, 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 sailor circumstance uh, all, all these uh you know there's there's like there's reliable dead tunes that you know are going to be great and then some nights they'll be like wow they just found it i'm like this with jack straw jack straw is a good live tune but some yeah, nights yeah. the jack straw when it gets to the climax it's like they suddenly all found it at the exact same moment and it's very exciting you know uh and that's the thing where the the communal quality it's both communal but also there's something communally going on with the band that you have to pursue almost almost in secret, you know, so that when it does happen on that special night, everybody gets to experience it, right? And you can't, that yeah. if you are doing something that involves an amount of improvisation and variance, you know, then you can't do that every night. It's just not going to happen every night. Sometimes it'll happen four or five nights in a row, and that's wild, right? But what you're mainly doing is doing the best show you can every night, but it differed enough every night and and pursuing something new enough nights in a row that when it reaches these these apexes it's like everybody can feel that something special is happening that's that to me is a big value of of playing live is like that you can go to those spaces I, and some degree that's familiarity too right i mean yeah. like you're, you're not going to know the inside ins and outs of a it's like it's like a friendship yeah yeah. When you first meet someone, like, oh, that person's interesting. There are these things that I like about them. Sure. And then later on, you're like, oh, wow, they have this depth of a field over here. And oh, my God, this is like the best person I ever met because of this reason. Same thing works for songs to a certain degree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that that's, uh, well, and it's, I think, and you mentioned uh, ego with, with writing earlier. And, and I think part of that is getting your ego out of the way, too. Uh, I, I would postulate that. Uh, oh, that, yeah. That's, Again, you can't be like you're talking about, you know, forcing things down people's throats. <laughs> like, no, you're going to listen to this song. This is what's going to be. And then you're like, well, all right, this one isn't working. Or, hey, this one was only OK. And like something really special happened with it. And we're going to honor that. Yeah, no, wait. it's about it's, it's finding this balance between like, you know, um, you do want to say after, you know, four or five times climbing some song up the hill, you know, this is not. So it's not landing, but but it, would, but it depends on how you feel about it, how important it is to you, because you also want to be enjoying yourself up there. But uh, but but yes, yeah, so there's a balance between thinking about that a little and not thinking about that too much. Um, you know, uh, but I absolutely think in all cases you should be thinking about the song and the audience, not about how you feel. You know, uh, I mean, ask anybody like a real Vegas performer or something who say, sung the same song every night, five nights a week for 20 years right you know yeah they're not they are literally <laughs> punching the clock now they may on some nights have great experiences but it's not about their experience or how they feel right it's about them being able to do the work and the work involves also being able to express in a way that 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 conveys to the people who are needing to have that experience with the music right so that's that's labor it's not you know those types of entertainers you know uh they're extraordinarily good at what they do, right? They're able to 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 do that and go, well, I'm going to sing, you know, I don't know, uh, if it's Shania Twain singing Still the One, right? I'm 100% certain she's probably sung that enough times 
you know, if she never has to sing it again, I'm sure she's quite content to never sing it again. But I bet she sings it every show, and I bet she murders it every show, right? And I bet some nights it actually finds some special pocket, right? Um, and that's sort of, that's that's what the craft is like. And it is a craft, and that goes back to what you were saying earlier yes. about, yeah. <laughs> well, it's legal, this craft, is what you were talking about. It's like, it should be. What's funny about yeah. it is because it involves performers, it also intersects with the ego, right? It, 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 yeah. You have to figure out how to, to make your ego one of the tools in the kit, you know? And the singer oh, is the guy yeah. who, like, is probably going to have a 51% ego, right? And so, uh, <laughs> and and is the guy who's, like, whose job it's going to be to know when to ride that ego and, and let the audience sort of join in it, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, that's the part I'm uncomfortable with because I would really, I would prefer, you know, one reason I'm the Mountain Goats is, like, I don't, I'm not trying to convince anybody that John Darnell is is special at anything. I'm not, um, you know, I have a developed skill set that I'm proud of and I like the stuff I make with it to be useful to people, but it's not about me being cool or good or special or anything like that. I'm not. Um, and, uh, and that's it. Thinking about it that way is extremely important to me. You know, at the same time, I'm a lead singer. There's ego in it for me. It's just what it is. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, yeah, but, but, but again, there, there's, you can paralyze yourself with lack of ego as well. And yeah, no, that's true. I did balance, man. <laughs> you got you to find the, the middle section there. Well, and that's, I find that, well, and it is a balancing act, right? And there are so many things going on. And I, I like your, I like your Shania Twain analogy. Cause again, that's, she's an entertainer, right? She's a professional entertainer. Yeah, but she's, she's an artist too. She's an artist. She's so. an artist as well. And there is artistry to it, but there's certain things about, like I'm, I have, I'm not going to check this data. I'm pretty sure the set list doesn't change that much, right? It's probably going to be the exact same set every night, uh, and, and that's for a reason because there's certain the lights are doing a thing. You know, there's maybe like I would assume there's some kind of like maybe there's pyrotechnics or something Kiss style. Who knows? I don't know. I, I've not seen a Shania Twain uh, concert, but it doesn't mean that there isn't uh, there isn't feeling behind it and passion behind it for the people that engage with it at all because it's a big show. Uh, I mean, Kiss is a perfect example, actually, invoking them, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, Kiss, I mean, Kiss, so Gene Simmons and I share a lot of the same opinions on this, that, like, you have a job, and your job is to please the audience, right? And uh, right. and so I'm a little less, I mean, Gene Simmons is like an all-in capitalist on this stuff. Yeah, it? I was going to say, it's one of his less odious opinions, for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, but I agree. Is, <laughs> I, I feel from him this one actually comes you know, two thirds from a place of love, like an appreciation. Yeah, he's like, he knows he's yeah. lucky to have this gig. Right. And he's like, if that is my gig, then I am there to do what they would like me to be doing. But, you know, yes, that's true. I think with our audience, people also know that, you know, it's most rewarding when it finds some place that you hadn't expected. You know, like that's the, it's, it's not rewarding if you just show up and play it, like, for Kiss, they need to show them and play the hits. The Mongos don't have hits, right? The Mongos have a couple of songs that everybody wants to hear. But after that, what we have is an energy that we're trying to locate, right? And that's not about yeah. the set list. That's about the set list that night, you know? Uh, so, so yeah, it's a little, it's different when you're talking about acts as big as these ones. Uh, I, I'll report to you that on September the 2nd, 2022, at Zappos Theater in Las Vegas, Shania Twain opened with Late Night Talking and then played Rock This Country and then played Love Gets Me Every Time and then played Life's About to Get Good. Uh, and then the next night, they didn't do Late Night Talking, but, oh, ooh, but okay. then they did right. Rock This Country and then Love Gets Me Every Time and then Life's About to Get Good and then Up and then Don't Be Stupid and then Come On Over. It looks like for most of that residency, it was largely the same. But the previous month... She had been opening with That Don't Impress Me Much, which is a song I absolutely cannot abide under any circumstances. Um, <laughs> Not my favorite, yeah. <laughs> but Rock This Country appears to have been largely... The this, this set list has, has very little variance, and you can't always trust whether the internet set list is going to be telling you the truth. <laughs> so, right, right. I mean, it, is, it is crowdsourced, but... You wonder whether the variance is like somebody... It looks like back in 2019, she had a complete... Well, not completely, but a largely different set list, so that's cool. Well, good for her. Good for her. I will say uh, on the on the subject of like uh, acts at that level, one of my favorites is that I, it was a picture of I, th I believe it was a Miley Cyrus set list, and on the set list was an asterisk. Yeah. That on the bottom, the notation was fan favorite. 
Interesting. So, so yeah, on ours, like because I have a solo section, <laughs> I just don't write anything down in the middle, right? I just I just do uh, whatever comes to mind. Uh, oh, wow. It might be. Yeah. I might come up with a song or two. I might wind up playing the same middle section two nights in a row if my mind is wandering and I can't think of anything else. But but yeah, so I'm flying solo for that section. I want I desire that level of spontaneity. In years where we tour a lot, a lot, we have sometimes just gone up with no set list and just called them. That's really fun when you can do it. But you have to be doing like 50 shows a year to... to yeah, you have to be running hot. Yeah, but I remember doing it in England where I was like, the dressing room was just this... I won't name the town, but the dressing room was terrible. And, and I didn't feel like I couldn't sit down because the couch was like literally a back breaking couch. And it's like, I, guys, I don't, I don't have any place to write down a set list. And John said, let's just, let's just call him. And, and I was okay, cool. And it was really great. Actually. It was like the saving grace of the show. That's fantastic. I mean, that's, I always attribute that to Fugazi because of course they, they, they never had a set list, which is, well, I mean, <laughs> Jazz right. acts uh, didn't used to. They would just go up and, and oh, call point. the yeah. band. The band leader would say, "Well, now we're going to do Autumn Leaves," you know, and uh, and you had you had a book. You had literally a book of of the ones you were expected to know if you were on the bandstand, and uh, so you just turn to that page and do those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, I'm, I'm thinking in rockist terms. I think is is what yes, <laughs> it's what you would call that, right? <laughs> but uh, it still was really cool. I, I want to. I want to talk a little bit about some of the more recent stuff, but, but before we do that, uh, I wonder, you know, I think the sunset tree is a magnificent record. Uh, mm-hmm. Someone I did not have the same experiences growing up, but I had a personally had a, what was explained to me later is not normal, somewhat traumatic childhood. And I've talked to a lot of other people who connect with that record. who feel the same. And in a way, it is a departure because it's, it's some degree of autobiography to it. Uh, when that record came out, and you also, and I should mention, there's also the uh, the Come Come to the Sunset Tree um, as well, which like alternate versions, which I think is, I love. I love that where it's like, but oh, those are the demos. Those are those are what I sent the band to learn the songs for the record. I, and and for me, it's like a, a like alternate universe uh, <laughs> renditions of the songs because certain things come out of the songs that that are in a demo that maybe are not going to in full band and vice versa, so on and so. I got it. Before we get into it with this, I got to tell you, I don't think you can really get your head around how many times Shania has opened with <laughs> with "Man, I Feel Like a Woman." Like yeah, he has started the set with that song. I can't conceive of this how many times. It's quite remarkable. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> is it is it in the triple digits? Probably. I, I I mean I can't. I'm just scrolling through page after page, and sometimes it's not that, but most of the time it's that. Uh, and I'm I'm talking about reaching back to 2002 and earlier. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, 45 pages of. Wow. That just. Well, if you me. have a good opener and it does the thing, then why it's change not it up? Broke. Like and I'm not going to fix it. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, like cheap trick always opens with hello there, right? Why that's great. You? Yeah, it's, 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 I, you know, this is the thing is you have to do something like that. You have to decide on that early. It's like, this is what I'm doing. This is what we're doing. We, we open yeah. with this because here's the thing. We always have, it doesn't always settle itself out the first night, but by the second or third night or tour, we have the one we're going to play as the opener these days. This was, out, we yeah. started doing this five years ago, I think probably. I used to always have a different opening number every night, but um, but if you have an opening number that you do, it really is a way of of making the space yours. Is like by the end of the first song, you're totally in your space. You're not, you know, it, it's really a, a way of sort of sort of uh, defining the terms of the room. It's really kind of great. But you know, on August the second, April the second, twenty thirteen, she opened with "I'm going to get you good." So. Ooh. <laughs> And I wonder, I wonder if that, if it didn't land the way she wanted. Uh, yeah, I no, I, I guess that was in 2013. She opened with that a bunch of times. Uh, that I, I think she. The thing is, that's 10 years into the, <laughs> into the absolute supreme reign of man. I feel like a woman. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. I feel like a woman's supremacy. <laughs> but then I'm yes. gonna get you good. Really, just takes over that spot. Uh, but I feel like, oh man, I'm gonna get you good. Gets a, a multi-year run of its own. Then rock this country takes over. Got I've it. never heard okay. that song. I I don't know it. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's great. I don't know. Yeah, I did. <laughs> it, it's 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 a, it's a noise collage. Uh, it's. <laughs> <laughs> I 
it was very surprising. Who, yeah, who knew she was in this country? But I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deceptive title. It's a noise collage uh, rooted in in the English post-industrial music around you know throbbing gristle type stuff. It was a surprising turn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> people love it because she follows it up with "Honey, I'm Home," and it's 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 very surprising. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's quite the dichotomy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's a master at work, really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so now that we've got our Shania Twain update, uh, Sunset Tree. I feel like, I feel like every within the the this confines of social media, I feel like there, there's always someone that may or may not even be a Mountain Goats fan, uh, explicitly or or yeah. uh, known that is discovers this year and like connects with it in some deep intrinsic way due to like whatever whatever they had going on that there were things to overcome and survive uh that that song is kind of in an upper echelon of indie rock in that way that i think there's a universality that um like i'm talking about people that like only listen to industrial music or only listen to you know like <laughs> maresmo or something and like but they find something deep and poignant uh in that song and connect with it and so it has like a, almost a, a life on its own to, to me it seems uh beyond the rest of the catalog and pantheon of, of mountain goats uh is that is that something you expected would at all when no uh, no, no. The, I, again like i don't think about that stuff and i don't yeah. i don't do songwriting or writing seminars or anything but like i think part of you know if i'm successful some of it is because i do not i don't think at all when i'm writing about you know, are people going to like this or not? <laughs> it's just not, it's not part of my calculus is uh, uh, because I just think it's, you know, then that's what you're writing about. If, if you're thinking about that, then your, your actual theme is whether people like it or not. You know, I'm trying to write actually to address my themes. So they need solitude with the, with, with me, you know, and with the text. Um, but it was, I think I misphrased that because I, I didn't mean like write it to be popular or anything. What I meant is that, like the fact that it isn't it, like that song does have an allegory. There, there, there's a story that's being told, but it's almost like the the details of the story don't matter as much as the emotional uh, points within. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, it, it, uh, there's a lot of rock stories like this where it's like it was just a song on the album, right? I didn't think it was a single or a hit or anything. We didn't think in those terms. Um, and, uh, you know, I had this song. It seemed pretty good. I wasn't done writing it. Uh, I told Peter I was going to probably add some more stuff to the chorus. And he said, no. He said, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I think this one's done. Uh, okay, well, we'll figure it out when we get to the studio. In the studio, uh, we were too busy to, for me to really fix it any further. So I left it alone. Right? Um, and, and that was you know the way Peter liked it the way he liked it. I wasn't particularly invested in this tune when we tracked it. I, mean, I was invested in it as far as I gave it my all, but, uh, but you know, but, but my favorite songs in the record are Pale Green Things and Deed of the Pie's Bones. Right? <laughs> and so I, I, those are both great as well, but yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. So, so I had no, I wasn't thinking about it any further than its role on the album. That was all I was thinking about. When, when, when I wrote it, I wasn't even thinking about that. I was just thinking about the song itself. When we tracked it, I was like, well, here's a song that, uh, that, you know, that I want to sound a certain kind of way. And then Vanderslice really took the reins on a lot of it. I think the hand claps were his idea. Um, and uh, we stood around doing those hand claps, three or four of us in front of a, a microphone in, uh, as an overdub. Um, but yeah, it's like it's that was Tiny Telephone. You did that, right? Yeah. No, no, uh, it was a Prairie Sun in Cotati. Oh, Prairie! Oh, yeah, the the, the Tom Waits uh, studio. Yeah, yeah, did, yeah. I think uh, we did three cool. records at Prairie Sun. We did Sunset Tree, Get Lonely, and Heretic Pride up there. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a that's a great one. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your train of thought with that. Oh, it's, it's okay. Just, My train of thought is not of any particular value. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I, I don't know where I was at. Huh? Well, I, uh, Dino Lopati, didn't he died like real young, right? Like, oh like, yes, like, uh, yeah, yeah, quite. Yeah, it's, he's he's one of those. There's a lot of classical figures um, who are very uh, who are romanticized in that way. I mean, the song's not really about Dino Lopati, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. This is well, precisely, but uh, uh, how about Up the Wolves? That that's that's one I I, I quite like on that one as well. Uh, uh, I, can you tell me anything about that song? The, like the entomology of that? Uh. I mean, I'll tell you this. I think I've told this story before. Um, recording the record 
recording any record is kind of, uh, you have to decide on what your approach is going to be for getting in the zone to get the vocal right, you know, uh, and that's, and it's, it's a little vocals interesting because you want with most music, with most vocal music to sort of be emotionally persuasive, but that doesn't mean being maximally emotive. It means finding exactly the spot where you're being just the right amount of emotive that you sound authentic, uh, you know, but not, uh, uh, but not just sort of bleeding all over the floor, you know, <laughs> like, that's not interesting, you know, it's not, and it doesn't persuade most people if that's what you're actually doing. When you go back to listen to it on tape, it just doesn't sound good. Um, it, it doesn't, you know, doesn't convince you either, but I need a, I need a personal connection a lot of the time to what I'm singing. That can be a physical connection. There've been some songs where I'm often digging my fingernails into my forearm to, to get a physical yeah. connection mm. to the experience. Uh, it's really hilarious when I do that. <laughs> so, it, uh, uh, cause I can dig pretty hard, but, uh, Oops. but for up the wolves, it was a pretty important song for me. And, and vocal tracking takes place in that Tom Waits room, which is remote from the control room. Nobody can even see you in there. That's kind of great sometimes, but it's also a little isolating. So I, um, I called Muka who runs the studio into my room and I asked him if he would sit with me while I played. Um, and he did, right? So Muka is sitting a couple feet from me in a chair, not rocking back and forth, not pumping his fist. He's just present with me, right? Right. That, and it, it's a single vocal take. It's live with the guitar. Um, it's not, there's no overdubs on it. And, uh, uh, and that I think is audible in the take that it's like, this is a story being yeah. told when somebody who hasn't heard it, Muka didn't have the demos, right? He's probably heard a few takes of the song at the point that we get the take, but it's new to him that morning. Right. Um, and, uh, and nobody else outside of camp has ever heard it at all. Right. And, uh, and so it's coming to life and Eric Friedlander is in the next room playing, or no, he overdubbed his cello later. Um, but Peter would have been playing his bass live. Uh, and I'm not sure if Franklin played, uh, his organ in the track or, or as an overdub. But uh, but for sure, bass and guitar and vocal are all going on live, and Mook is sitting directly in front of me with his head, you know, in a, uh, not hung, I don't want to say, but, you know, his head lowered and listening thoughtfully, rocking a little bit like you do when you're listening to music, rocking back and forth a little bit. And and that was really intense. It was really great. You know, it was really a way of, of being present to the song instead of to my own thoughts, right? And so I haven't done that that often, but I've done it a few times. The first time I had done that was the album before on um, uh, We Shall All Be Healed. I asked right. a couple of people to come and, and just hang out and, and dance around or whatever while I was tracking pigs, right? Uh, pigs that ran straight away in the water, Triumph of. Uh, I, I had Temba and uh, who, Temba and Nora who played violin. And um, what did Temba play? I can't remember now, <laughs> but, uh, it's been a long, it's been but 20 I, years ago. I had them come in and hang out and they just, I remember them dancing, you know, it was really cool. Right, um, right. So, that's I awesome. mean, that's, that's one thing is sort of like, you know, the vocal booth. I mean, it's, it's, it's even a cliche to think of how far up their own ass people can crawl when they're in the vocal booth, you know, thinking stuff, <laughs> and, stuff you know, and the trick with good that. singing is to not be in your head like that, to not be thinking about yourself, to not be thinking about how you look, to not be thinking about how people are going to take it, but to just be singing, to just be serving the song. That's a phrase people use in the music business a lot, serving the song, right? Yeah. You're not there to express in the song. You did that when you wrote the song, right? Uh, and your expression will come just through the use of your technique, right? So what you're doing is trying to serve the song as best you can. And one way of doing that is to get as far out of your own sort of self-obsession as you can. But I guess there's probably people who, who, you know, for whom that's not true, who like want to be looking at a mirror while they do it. But that's not me. Well, and that's why there's so many studios that like uh, take great pains to like make ambiance and make like a, a like a comfortable environment or something to not have people in their in their head uh, about things. You know, <laughs> you know whether it's like and certain things not for me like scarves or something like whatever candles. Okay, sure, whatever whatever floats your boat. Uh, but the idea is, yeah, you want to get in a, in a place where you're not thinking too hard about it it's interesting yeah it, it is almost like the sublimation of ego again uh coming up to it to a certain to a certain degree at least for the performance of it that's uh i think that i think that's very astute uh, is there any reason why collapsing stars never made the the, the record 
Yeah, we had a we had a studio version of it that just wasn't uh, you know, everything's about sequence for me, right? Um, okay, sure. Yeah. That, that where does it fit? It's it's a self contained story that doesn't really belong on the record. You know, all the other songs yeah. are in some yeah. sense or another my story. That's not right. That's just a story, right? It's 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 kind of a best ever death metal type story. It belongs in so far as it you know recognizably the people in it are kind of in the same sort of messed up zone as I was in the time I'm writing about my life, but it's not, it doesn't belong, you know, so. This is a good reason as any for it to be, not be on the record, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's just the last thing I, I don't want to, I mean, this isn't like the sun century podcast or anything, but uh, I, I just love, love, love. That's to me, that comes from the, <laughs> like almost a straight line from like the Beatles thing, uh, but like with a modernist twist, and and I, I think that that's a <laughs> there's a danger zone, if you will, for that level of earnestness sometimes, and and I think that one is is, is right down the line. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I, I I would agree with that. You know, I, I think that was pushing that, testing that membrane. You know. Yeah, there's <laughs> there's definitely a, the, the schmaltz factor that's all, that's always on the uh, horizon, right? But I, I think that that one, you know, I, I don't know if there's anything to say about that one necessarily, but I think that one uh, walks that balance beam very nicely. Well, thanks. Uh, so Heretic Pride is, I think, an underrated record in, in the Pantheon. Um I love Lovecraft in Brooklyn. I think that's a great tune. Uh, I, I'm a big Lovecraft fan, uh, despite the <laughs> systemic racism of the, of the man. Uh, racism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the racism. The, the beyond problematic racism. Uh, but I, I think that that's uh, I think that's a jam. I think there's there's a lot of uh, great songs on there. You got Michael Myers Resplendent, Resplendent as well. That's another one I love. Um, can you tell me a little about Heretic Pride? I think it kind of gets short shrift but, uh, after the the sort of like bright sun of uh, some of the ones around it. Um, maybe that's just my personal. I don't know, man. I, wasn't that right after uh, Get Lonely? Oh, you, you're right. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah actually, any love when it came out. Get Lonely had to wait a long time <laughs> for anybody to notice that it was like I, I'm a big defender. I, I, I like Get Lonely. Uh, oh well, yeah. It's a woke up news on that one. That's a that's yeah. a great tune. But, um, uh, Title yeah. track. So I don't. The thing is, I try not to think too much about that. With "Get Lonely," it just stick sure, sure, with sure. me. But uh, but that's something I, you know, I just sort of like. We live in an age when people are constantly like commenting on what their review said, and that to me is so crass. It's like I don't, I don't want to be the guy going, "Oh well, the reviewer said this." I don't. Their job, yeah. Is who to cares? Review who cares and, well, it's not just who cares. It's like, it's you know, that is their job is to say what they think of the records, you know, um, good or bad, right? And I don't expect them to hear the record the way I hear it. Um, if, if that were my expectation, I'd write the review myself. And so, uh, you know, uh, so, so yeah, so I don't know, I don't know what, what place it really, it really holds. I think there's a lot of people who really like it that when we play Heretic Pride live, people respond pretty, pretty heavy. Um, you know, I think it's a very well sequenced record. The way a record is received will have to do, will have to do with whether it has a, a clear overarching theme or whether that theme is more diffuse, right? Um, yeah. if the theme is diffuse and not presented in a way where you're saying, here's what this record is, um, then it can be harder for people to find an anchor in the record as a record. And they'll tend to just listen to, to individual songs. Um, an album otherwise outside of a very clear theme is a, is a sort of a, a um, it's a very abstract way of reading art, right? It's like when you read a short story collection, if you have a good critic, he can point out to you what the themes of the story share are, right? But in the absence sure. of that critic, often a lot of them say, well, here's 15 stories by the same guy, you know? And so, uh, and I think, you know, Heretic Pride is one of those where these are all short stories and they do sort of circle some themes, um, but uh, but it also is sort of like, it, it's more of a more of a buffet, you know, than, uh, than Get Lonely or The Sunset Tree or uh, Life of the World to Come, you know, or Goths. I, th I think as far as not just song selection, but sequencing, that's, I think one of the, I mean, I don't think any of them are poorly sequenced, but I think the sequencing of that one especially uh, lends itself for a good listening experience as a record uh, as well, which I understand, which I understand is a dying art. Don't get me wrong, but that's how I listen to stuff. Yeah, like, no, yeah. we, we do sequence. Uh, we it used to be very communal and now I kind of take a, a, 
a lot more of a here's what I think. You know, anybody has any major objections, let me know. But uh, right, right. but I'm I'm pretty uh, I'm I'm, I'm pretty I, I finally gotten a little better at saying look I. I have a good idea here. <laughs> so, where yeah, like, past like, twenty mark. Well, like but, Lonely yeah. was completely committee between me and Peter. It's, it's a two man committee, yeah. but it's like sending set lists back and or sending sequences back and forth and back and forth. Um, you know, Sunset Tree actually had a lot of label input, and it was to the betterment of the record that Chris Sharp. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> he, uh, uh, I you know because I always want to put the really good songs toward the end of the album, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like here's your treat at the end yeah yeah, yeah and chris was like i remember the email that said i will release whatever record you want to release this is your record right having said that or no was that sunset tree no it was it was we shall all be healed he said but uh so i gotta look it up so i get this right um uh, uh he said i will release whatever record you want to release and i know it will be a great record no matter what because i love these songs but having said that, I would be remiss in my duties as the head of the label releasing your record if I did not tell you that the optimal way to release this record is for the first four songs to be in order, Slowest Vultures, Mon Cardiaja, Linda Blair is Born Innocent, and Letter from Belgium. <laughs> so, That's awesome. I love that. that. That's a, yeah, because it, it's very respectful, right? It's, it's sort of like a friend giving advice. Yeah, That's I'm trying advice. to think of what I wanted to put up closer. Uh uh, it was probably the Young Thousands because I was really fond of that song. Um, Good one. Yeah. I'm looking at the sequence and wondering, wondering what I wanted to put up further. That is a pretty solid opening block, though. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> I wonder. Oh, it's probably that I wanted to put Palm Quarter somewhere toward the end. Yeah, that's probably. What oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, that, I mean, that could be cool, but. Yeah, it just there's definitely the the funniest thing about sequencing is it's definitely easy to tell when somebody gets it wrong. Yeah, at least for personal taste, you Maybe. know. But it's hard. These days, where I'm at with sequence is like if a sequence seems wrong, come back to it later, you know. Because uh, like one of the get lonely sequences we, that we threw away, I posted about it at some point somewhere. You know, I dug it up, and yeah. uh, and it was. Uh, and it was completely different from what we came up with, one hundred percent, right? And um, and and I'd forgotten about all this back and forth we had done, where like for a long while of getting the sequence together, me and Peter were very into maybe Sprout Wings is the opener, maybe Sprout Wings is absolutely the opener. Oh, whoa, okay. Well, it's a totally. I mean, huh. the record is about the same stuff with that, but God, yeah. it's just a much darker record if you do that. It's, like, <laughs> it's going to hit it's totally different. Very yeah. intense thing to open with a song in D minor and, and a slow one with a heavy bass there, you know. Uh, and so, so that was super. Uh, that that was super instructive, you know, uh, to to look at all that because I mean, it was like one of those things like back and forth and back and forth, and then we arrived at the one and said, "Oh no, that's good actually. It's good Wild Sage actually. Well, who knew, right? Well, now I can't even imagine the album." Opening any other way. But, um, yeah, it doesn't doesn't seem like it would make sense, but that, that that's wild. That, yeah, that would have informed the record completely differently for sure. Yeah. Uh, 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 so okay, so um, let me see. Let me see if I can. Um, there it is. Let's see here. No, that's that's the the one we actually sent. Where is it? Oh, do you have do you have the do you have the the details in front of you? Do you have it? No, I have, I have the final one I sent that Peter and me arrived at. But somewhere on here, I used to have, uh, oh, get lonely sequence. Peter's preference. Uh, that's yeah. awesome. That's awesome that you you have it and have it in front of you. That's great. Yeah, well, you don't have to worry about memory being an unreliable narrator there. <laughs> so yeah, Peter's sequence at the time. Although when we went back and forth until we found one that we both liked, and it's what came out. Uh, but mine, prior to the arrival at that, I'm gonna tell you this, and then I got my my at an hour and a half of talking, my throat starts to sort of ask for. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah. But um, so mine was maybe Sprout Wings, Get Lonely, Moon Over Goldsboro, Woke Up New, New Monster Avenue, Half Dead, Wild Sage, In the Hidden Places, Song for Lonely Giants, If You See Light, Cobra Tattoo, and In Corolla. Peter Light, maybe Sprout Wings, In the Hidden Places, Half Dead, Wild Sage, If You See Light, New Monster Avenue, Moon Over Goldsboro, Song for Lonely Giants, Get Lonely. And the thing is, I know I would never have agreed to have two songs in a row with Lonely in the title. It's like, no, we can't do that. It's, it's aesthetically, right. I can't agree with that. <laughs> Cobra Tattoo, In Corolla, and Woke Up New. And I'm certain we went back and forth a lot about it. 
Um, and I'm finding this not from the old emails, but from when I, I sent it back to Peter to go, hey, I, I dug this up. And we had a long discussion about uh, how like he loved Hidden Places in the Two Spot, and he was right. Hidden Places in the Two Spot is real nice. I like what we came up with best of all, obviously, but that's because that's what won. Right? So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's, it's winner's history of rock and roll. Really. Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay, so so let's I'll, I'll, I'll speed around through a bunch of this stuff. Um, what is, <laughs> sax Romer? Why is the Sax Romer number one? Because it's the first take of the song. <laughs> okay, I was I was reading way much into it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, the da, 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 da. oh um. Damn these vampires! That that was uh, was that was that a response to like Twilight and all that that was that was kicking around at the time? No, not in any way. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I like that. I like that tune a lot. I think that's actually an underrated record within the Pantheon. Uh, can you tell me about for Charles Bronson briefly? Um. So I mean, it's it's pretty. It's pretty plain. It's not an allegory or a metaphor. It's it's. it's no, no. I mean, more like how did how did like why did how did that come to be oh, like? I like right? these guys. I like I like I like these guys who um. Who have a thing they do and are are like you know are 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 determined to get to do it you know he he was he grew up extraordinarily poor um and uh and he winds up studying proper acting right he's like he's a strasbourg right. student i think uh but he winds up in action movies right and uh and he has this face like a fellini like face that's going to be like the star of any movie it's in right uh right. and i'm just interested in him as, a, as an icon really I, I spent way too much time on the early stuff, but I'm not going to be able to talk too much about the later stuff. But I did, I, I, as someone who arguably had his life somewhat saved by the escapism of role playing games, tabletop role playing games, uh, and League with Dragons, I, I I was super excited to be like, oh, <laughs> what a uh, record about uh, RPGs! That's amazing. <laughs> uh, what what what? What got you to uh, take the plunge for that, or did the songs come first? Songs came first. It? Songs came first. Uh, and uh, but the title in League with Dragons was there early, so so yeah. So I had I had a, a loose idea about about roles and inhabiting roles, um, you know, persona, um, and which is something I'm doing anyway a lot of the time, right? But uh, but I thought of it in terms of especially the the fantasy stuff I'd been into when I was twelve, you know. Uh, and uh, and and uh, and that sort of you know, sort of uh, uh, see, scenes in which the stakes seem very high, <laughs> and so uh, right. that that sort of thing, you know, fire and fury, that kind of stuff. Do you think there'll ever be a good D and D movie? No. <laughs> 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 they will not. <laughs> they keep trying. They certainly keep trying, man. Yes, and they, and they they must. <laughs> They, I mean, I think honestly, uh, I think the closest they may have gotten is those two recent Jumanji movies. Uh, I haven't, movie. I haven't seen them. Uh, uh, I wouldn't call them like. There's not going to be a Criterion Collection edition anytime soon. Let's put it that way. But yeah. they're, they're they're fun movies. Uh, getting into knives. Um, that's a. <laughs> It's got to be one of my favorite uh, album titles and album covers. Pretty happy with the title, yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah it's pretty great, dude. <laughs> that's one you got to just give yourself a little bit of like, yeah, that's that's good. You got to give yourself an attaboy on that it goes, one. It sat in a notebook for a long time, waiting for its moment. <laughs> uh, you, uh, you, uh, is it right? Am I correct that you uh, track that you track that Memphis right? Was that with the, the cramps? Uh, uh, yeah, we did that at. Uh, um... Uh, Sam Phillips. Uh, Sam Phillips. So yeah, that's yeah. it's the studio that Elvis built for himself, but didn't wind up using much. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's that's basically my that's my that's my commentary on that one is that is that that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, it, it's like the Chris Farley bit, right? Um, the okay, so so let's you know what I I'm speaking of album covers. Bleed Out's great. That's a great album cover. Oh, that's, thank that's you. The, yeah, I can't take any credit for it, but yeah, <laughs> designer did a great job. <laughs> It looks like a you know seventies cop thriller. Uh, yeah, well, it's specifically like an Italian one. They're, these Italian right. uh, 70s cop thrillers are their own genre. Yeah, yeah, just like how uh, Giallo is its, its own. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, this stuff is is, is adjacent yeah. to Giallo. It's called a uh, poliziteschi, I think. Oh, I didn't know there's a word for it. I oh, mean, yeah, I no, it's a whole. Um, they're really incredibly nihilistic movies. Um, 
uh, let me get the exact word, uh, poliziotesky. Um, and it's a subgenre of crime and action movies from the late 60s uh, and the early 70s. And there's tons of them. And they're, they're just absolutely very, um, they're very amoral wastelands. <laughs> and they're great. Right. And, and, and the movies have more good cars in them than you can see in any other movies. Right, right, which 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 is which is very key. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's a that's a ripper record. There's some pretty good usage of loud guitars uh, on on there. Yeah, um, it's a loud record. It's a, it's it's a big uh, big jumper. Is that something where that was that, again that that was like an aesthetic decision, or is that yes. just how it turned out? No, I decided out? to write all up tempo stuff. I, 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 okay. I, uh, the thing is, we we love the down tempo, smoky groove stuff. That's what we really love to play. Right. We love to yeah. play anything together, um, but I like. I wrote. I was watching action movies. I was. I was. Uh, and I was like, you know, what if I just did a record where it's all like this? <laughs> so, all all yeah. good creative decisions, I think, start with you know, what if I just did this? <laughs> so, so right. It has right. To have that, I can't speak for everybody else, but like for me, it has to have that casual quality to the to the outset. Instead of going, I shall now make a record that does no. Like, well, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I know people who do that. It's like well, now I'm going, yeah. now I'm I'm going to do this, and no one can stop me. I don't think that way. I think like you know what if I what did you say this? <laughs> so so, yeah. so that was what, how that started, and it was like, and then that was the ethos. It was like each one. I'm like, well, I'm not looking to go slower than you know 90 beats per minute, and uh, and I like restrictions like that. I, they they they're useful. John, this has been great, man. Thanks so much for spending so much time with me. My uh, pleasure, man. Uh, I'm, I am going to try my best to see you on this current tour. I just realized that I haven't seen you since beat the champ came out, which is crazy. Cause it feels right. like that was yesterday and it was not, it was not yesterday. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm going to try to catch one of the shows. I'll put some of the tour dates in the, uh, show notes so people can, uh, come check out the band. And, uh, and, and, uh, I think it's, it's always a good show. I hope I get to see it. <laughs> I, might, I might actually be playing myself during, unfortunately, when you're well, in this. You area. know, we'll be back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say, but knowing you guys, it won't, it won't be for long. Uh, last question. This is the only can question that I ever ask, and you can choose to interpret it however you like. But why do you do what you do? I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, it, it started very casually for me. It's I, 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 I I've been writing since I was a child and it's just writing, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it, it, it's where I, I, I do it because it's what I do. That's as good as answer as any. <laughs> well, I for one appreciate it. So, uh, thank, thank you, you very much. And, uh, yeah, uh, take care and, uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, man, the pleasure was mine. Good to meet up with you. It's amazing to have, uh, have this sort of happen, uh, you know, just because we ran into each other at the uh, June of 44 show. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, it, this is very, very off uh, chance uh, meeting, but uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Don't take it lightly. For, well, thanks, for sure. a good conversation. I'll talk to you again. All right. There he goes, Mr. John Darnell. Let's have a training montage. Water dripping from the pipes down in the basement. Bare feet on a concrete floor. Notches on the wall of my solitary cell. Sweat dripping out of every pore It feels like it takes forever It's maybe five minutes on screen But the horns will swell and the strings will sound When that flipped quarter hits the ground I'm doing this for revenge
just another mile to go But the strings will keen and the horns will cry When it's just me against the sky
like the North Star I want to wallow in the spoils before the crowd I want to play my guitar Not gonna sit up and beg Not gonna do tricks Not gonna stand here on a soundstage Tethered to a crucifix Ride's over, I know, but I'm not ready to go. I want to flash my pastel colors by the rail on a windy day at Pim. songs with this clown they set me up with in a Los Angeles rehearsal studio not gonna tour with Trent Reznor third of three bottom of the bill you can't pay me to make that kind of music not gonna swallow that pill over I know 
It Kills Me. That is this year, of course, by the Mountain Goats. What an incredible tune. What a great record. I could I really could have just nerded out with them on just that record. <laughs> but uh Yeah, so much to cover with that guy. John Daniel, man. What 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 a what a what an amazing artist. Uh before that, shelved off of Goths. Best ever death metal band out of Texas from back in the day. And before that, training montage. And that's off of the most recent record, Bleed Out. Very good. We taught, we didn't talk about it at all, but it's like the loud rock record, and I just can't believe I spent so little time talking about it. But it's what it is. Anyway, Mountain Ghosts are on tour. Go find out all about that on their website and wherever you find out such information. I suppose that would also work. This has been Kona Neutron Protonic Reversal. Thank you so very much for listening to it. This show airs live Thursdays, 8 Eastern, 7 Central, 6 Mountain, 5 Pacific. YouTube, Twitch, of course, podcasted later everywhere. Archives always available for free. No ads, no sponsors, no kidding. Protonicreversal.com. But if you'd like to support the show and get episodes sooner, you can give $1 a month at patreon.com slash protonicreversal and uh, achieve both goals. Support the show and get it sooner. 50,000 watts of power. Of course, if you like the show or you missed a single episode, please consider subscribing on your application or site of choice. Like the episode or even post a review. It's all that helps people find the show. Beats the almighty algorithm, man. Uh, it's just a darn nice thing to do. This microphone turns sound into electricity. Doing some recording next week, so I think we're going to be off, but there's some great stuff coming up. Stay safe out Can there. Can you hear me now? I'll check you I'm later. On Route 128, in the dark and lonely. I got my radio on. Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the... It's the end of radio! The last announcer plays the last record! The last what? Leaves the transmitter! Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you 
If there's no one there to receive It's the end of radio As we come to the close of our broadcast day